grace, mercy, and peace be yours tonight from God our Father, from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Dear friends, even though this is my first time to preach here at St. Peter, I hope you don't mind if I share a little bit with you about my family. My wife and I have two sons, and our youngest son, Theo, married his bride, Elizabeth, earlier this summer. And it was with great pride and a good bit of emotion that I had the privilege of performing that wedding ceremony. For the wedding sermon that I preached at that ceremony, I selected three verses out of the Old Testament book, Song of Songs. Song of Songs is an often overlooked, maybe misunderstood, book of the Old Testament. On the one hand, Song of Songs talks about a, a close, personal, very intimate relationship between a young man and a young woman. But on the other hand, Song of Songs also talks about a close, personal, very intimate relationship between God and his people. And I think both apply in marriage. I won't share with you the entire sermon that I preached for their, my son's wedding this summer, but of the three scripture verses, one that I used was from chapter 2, verse 4. He's invited me to his banquet hall, and his banner over me is love. Now here's what's going on in this verse. In the book of Song of Songs, the king is having a celebration. And because of his love and affection for a certain young woman, he's invited her to be his guest at the celebration. And because of her love and affection for him, she's accepted the invitation. And as she enters the banquet hall, there's the, the king's sign, a flag, a banner, a symbol, if you will, indicating that she has come to the right place. Therefore, the verse. He's invited me to his banquet hall, and his banner over me is love. Well, I think something similar happens in marriage. When a young man invites a young woman to marry him, he invites her to share her life with him. And by her consent to marry him, she accepts the invitation. And by no surprise there, the, the banner, the symbol, the sign, if you will, over them is love. But now here's the question for us. What kind of love is that? Well, maybe it would seem that the answer to that question would be rather obvious, but actually in the Greek language of the New Testament, there are several different words used for love. And I think we could say that all of them find expression in the marriage relationship. But I want to specifically zero in on the word for love that we heard read about in our epistle reading tonight from Ephesians chapter 5. In over 30 plus years of being a pastor, I've lost track of the number of couples that I've married. But I can tell you that for every couple that I have married, in our premarital counseling process, the, the very last session is reserved to sit down with the couple and review the words of Ephesians 5 that you just heard. And here's what I usually do. I will, I will read those words out loud, and then I'll ask the couple this question. Based on those words of Ephesians 5, who do you think has the hardest, the most difficult, may I say the more challenging role? Husband or wife? And as you might imagine, there's usually a long pause there. It's not intended to be a trick question. But what I'm getting at is this. I suggest that according to the words of Ephesians 5, the one who has the hardest, the most demanding, the more challenging role is the husband. And here's why. Paul says, husbands, love your wife as Christ loved the church. 
You see, based upon the different words for love in the Greek New Testament, the word for love used here is it means a self-sacrificing, selfless kind of love. As husbands, we are instructed to love our wife as Christ loves us. So what kind of love is that? It's not a conditional love. It's an unconditional love. It's not a me first kind of love. It's a selfless kind of love. It's a love where Christ put you first. It's a love where Christ was willing to lay down his life and sacrifice. The kind of love that husbands are called upon to demonstrate to their wives is one of selflessness and sacrifice. But now, what does Ephesians 5 say about a wife? Well, that question of who has the hardest, the more difficult job, husband or wife, always seems to get a little tricky here because in this reading, the Apostle Paul says, wives, submit to your husbands. Well, what's that all about? Well, maybe it's helpful to look first at what the word does not mean before we look at what the word submit means. Submit here does not mean you're just supposed to give in to everything. Submit does not mean that if you are being mistreated, if you are being taken advantage of, if you are being misused, mistreated, abused, you just have to put up with it. That's not what it means. Submit does not mean remaining silent or withholding your opinion. None of that is what the word submit means. Rather, the intention is for a wife to submit to the belief that your husband will in fact love you as Christ loves the church. That your husband will put you first. That your husband will be selfless towards you. That your husband will display servant leadership in his role of marriage. Therefore, a wife is called to submit to the understanding that your husband loves you like Christ loves you. You see, this is what I think Paul is trying to get at. If a husband loves his wife like Christ loves the church, selflessly, sacrificially, then that can't help but be motivating for a wife to love her husband back selflessly and sacrificially. And when a wife does that, that can't help but empower a husband to, to love her selflessly and sacrificially. And when she does that, that, that motivates him all the more. And so what I think happens is this continual cycle of selfless, sacrificial love, not an arrangement of here, but one of here, which is why the Apostle Paul says in verse 21, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. But now here's why the husband's role is so key. Because for this to happen, someone has to take the lead. Someone has to start things off. Someone has to get the ball rolling. Someone has to make the first move. And that starts with a husband who is called to be a servant leader to his wife in marriage. Marriage author and speaker Emerson and Sarah Eckridge describe the dynamics of the husband-wife relationship this way. Perhaps, they say, the Apostle Paul is assigning each marriage partner to what is hardest, most difficult for him or her. You see, husbands are most tempted by nature to dominate their wives, but instead they are instructed to love them sacrificially. And likewise, wives are most tempted to not always want to follow their husband's lead, and so they are instructed to respect their husband as the servant leader who puts her first. Is it any wonder then that the Apostle Paul says in Ephesians 5, this is a profound mystery? It sure is. And lo and behold, there have been struggles in marriage 
ever since the very beginning. After all, the very first couple, Adam and Eve, experienced difficulties in their relationship. Eve tried to get Adam to do something that God told him not to do, but Eve tempted him to do it, and he did it. But notice, she didn't force him. She didn't triple-dog dare him to do it. She didn't bribe him or twist his arm. She tempted him, sure. But he made the decision to do it and then blamed her for it. And there have been struggles in marriage ever since. But notice in the early chapters of the book of Genesis that it's right after this first marriage disagreement, right there in the Garden of Eden, that immediately God promises a solution to all of our fractured relationships. The first announcement of hope and forgiveness and new life and a second chance between us and God and between us and each other came right in response to what happened there in the first marriage. And it was there that God promised a solution. It was there that God said he would send a savior. It was there that, that we first hear about Jesus who is offering himself as a sacrifice. It's there where, where we hear that Jesus is willingly going to take upon himself our mistakes. Jesus who receives in his own flesh the, the punishment that our mistakes deserve. And in doing all of that, God makes it clear that he's putting you first. Jesus invites you into a relationship with him, and his banner over you is his selfless, sacrificial love for you. Dear friends, I realize that this message it's pretty much all about marriage. And I also realize that not all of us here are married. We're all at different places in our life. I'm sure that there are some couples here who are happily enjoying married life now for 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60 years or more. And if that's where you're at in life, that's great. But I would also suspect that there are probably some couples here who may just be enduring marriage. Maybe you're just barely hanging on. Maybe you're just going through the motions. Maybe you're just doing the best you can to get by day by day. And if that's where you are, that's where you are. I also realize that there are people here who aren't married yet, and maybe you, you hope to be someday. I also suspect that there are probably people here who have been married, but you might still be dealing with some of the pain and scars left behind after divorce. The point is, I realize that we are at all different places in our life. But no matter who you are, and no matter what your situation in life is, I want to say to you that God, through his son, Jesus Christ, has invited you into a relationship with him. And his banner over you is his selfless, sacrificial love that he has for you. Earlier I mentioned that our youngest son, Theo, married his bride, Elizabeth, earlier this summer. They were married the first weekend of June. It was hot that day. It turned out to be a beautiful wedding. It was extremely hot in southern Georgia that day. It was an outside wedding. Did I mention it was hot that day? 
One of the things that Elizabeth's mother really wanted to have happen is in that outdoor venue for the two of them to be married under a structure called a hoopah. A hoopah is made out of raw cut cedar beams that were assembled on site the day before the wedding. But for weeks leading up to that wedding, Theo and Elizabeth would take, they took a a wood burning instrument and they carved into the upper beams that would be over top of them as they stood underneath it. They carved into those upper beams scripture passages. Scripture passages that were particularly meaningful to them as they grew up in their lives at various different points in their life. And so as they stood under that hoopah and exchanged their vows, literally the banner, the the sign, the symbol, the words over them was God's love for them as they made their beginning as husband and wife. Wherever you are in life, happily married or just hanging on, single or divorced, a widow, a widower, male or female, young or old, whoever you are, know this. God has invited you into a relationship with him And who you are, or where you're at, or what you've been through, or what you might be going through, no matter what. His banner over you is the sacrificial, selfless love that God has for you through his son, your savior, Jesus Christ. No matter what. In his name. Amen.